Right. Thank you so much, Sebastian, and I'm honored to be here today. And I've been so excited looking forward to this for, for many weeks because I wanted to be here with you today. And uh, I woke up this morning at around 5 a.m. and I was so excited. I just want to pick up the phone and call each of you. I just didn't know your, phone, your, your room number because I would have picked up the phone and called and said, let's get together and let's get started because I prepared some fresh, some brand new materials I've never presented anywhere. So I'm so excited I can share this with you today for the first time. So, so a lot of this will be, will be a, a fresh new things that I'm very excited about. So um, I, 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 I'm trying to rename my talk um, the refactoring of the refactoring because in this talk I will, I will present a lot of the change, a lot of the growth that has happened in our refactoring community. And uh, I'm organizing my talk in three parts. So in the first part, I, I, I'm going to attempt, should I say, I'm going to attempt to map this landscape of thousands of research papers that have, that have sprung in the field of refactoring in the last decade. Um, and the reason why I'm doing this is because I think this community wants to grow. I think this community is interested to, to learn from, from other communities. And maybe you can look at the lessons that have enabled this uh, huge growth in our community. And this is how this community can also grow and can have a significant impact on the practice of, of the field. Um, the second part of my talk, I will give some examples of where this growth has come up into my group and what my group has been doing uh, in the field of research for particular for the domain of mobile and smartphone apps. And uh, in the last part of my talk, I will present uh, some of the lessons that I'm learning in my career. And again, this is, this is I will take you sort of like behind the scenes and I will show you, um, uh, you know, how, how I'm doing and what I'm learning and wh what, what I'm learning both professional and also in my personal life now. And I'm, again, super excited to share these lessons with you because I know that, that uh, they will add lots of value to you. So um, uh, let's, let's get started with the, first, with the first part of my talk, with the landscape of this refactoring field. So how many people here have ever, carried a, have ever performed a refactoring? Okay, I see most, most hands, okay, even, even okay. Most, most hands have, have a, um, so, so I fell in love with refactoring in the uh, year 2000 when I read uh, Martin Fowler's uh, famous classic refactoring book, and his definition of refactoring was that it is a change, it is a transformation, it's a source-to-source -source change um, that is supposed to improve the internal structure, to the internal structure, it is supposed to make some improvements. Uh, those improvements are supposed to make it easier to read and understand the code, uh, at the same time without introducing other bugs or without introducing unintended behavior, so we want to preserve the current functionality. So I read Martin Fowler's book in 2000 and uh, has had a profound impact upon my professional life and upon the way how I think about software. And uh, apparently, you know, I have uh, uh, fell in love with it because I've been sticking with refactoring ever since. I've been working on refactoring ever since 2000. Um, so so um, again, now that you've seen this definition, uh, how many people here have ever renamed the function? Okay, even more hands than before. How many people here have ever, you know, if you have a long complex function uh, that it's, it's, it's too large and too complex to understand, you break it down into simpler functions that are easier to understand and easier to reuse? Okay, even more hands than before. So I, I think officially you are all graduated, officially you all passed the IQ test. You are all uh, refactoring experts now. So, <laughs> so um, a couple of other books that have been very influential in the field but also have a profound influence upon my professional growth uh, have been uh, uh, Joshua Kerevsky's book on how do we refactor, how do we introduce design patterns, how do we retrofit design patterns in our code, and uh, um, uh, uh, working effectively with, with large legacy pieces of software. So um, how do we refactor legacy code? And refactoring today uh, has been extremely influential in the field of software engineering. In fact, refactoring is one of the top field menus in all modern IDEs. So if you open your favorite IDE, you look in the top level, you see file, first, first menu, then edit, and usually probably the third one is refactoring. So this is in, in Visual Studio, in AdBeans, in IntelliJ, uh, in Eclipse, in, in, in uh, I don't think that Emacs has it yet, but, uh, but other than that, it's in, it's in all modern IDEs that, that are used by 90% of the software developers today. Uh, and in fact, uh, back in 2000, I uh, created the first open source refactoring tool for Java as a plugin for, um, uh, back then it was an ID called JEdit. It's still in use today, but not as famous as it used to be uh, two decades ago. 
And uh, 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 in fact, you know, it's interesting to remember the times. So at that time, I was competing head to head with IntelliJ. Um, you know, they were supporting a refactoring. I was supporting another refactoring. And then, you know, sometimes I was beating them. Sometimes they would beat me up. And then I gave up finally because I realized that I cannot compete with the company. It was a company, professional company, who had a team of developers. And I just, you know, I, I, I stopped contributing to IntelliJ. And the first lesson that I, uh, that I learned was uh, you need a team to be successful. You cannot be successful on your own. So that's when I, I decided I'm going to join the Eclipse team. So I've been contributing then on the Eclipse team, uh, on the refactoring tools in Eclipse since 2004. Um, but today I want to talk a little bit about some of the growth that has happened on the academic side. So refactoring community has seen a tremendous growth. And if you look at, um, at here what I'm tabulating, it's, it's uh, for each year from, from, from early 90s to 2016, and here on the vertical is the number of research papers. These are peer-reviewed uh, research papers that have been published in the topic of refactoring. Uh, here is, is this important around 99 and 2000. It's when Martin Fowler's refactoring book came up and also when uh, IntelliJ and, and JEdit started to support refactorings. But if you look, uh, you need to look back a decade before you have seen this growth in industry. We need to look back a decade earlier and um, uh, the, the birth of a refactoring, a lot of the growth happened sort of underground. So it's a lots of years with just one, two, three, four research papers per year before uh, it finally took off in industry. So um, let me take you a little bit back to those first decade of refactoring, what they call the humble, the humble beginning of the field. Or, or, or um, uh, this is where we are talking about. You know, you know. Uh, I'm not looking at fossils because these people are still alive, but these are the champions, these are the pioneers, these are the giants in our field on, on whose shoulders we have built and have uh, seen all this huge growth of the community. So a uh, first published paper was in 1990 at the University of Illinois. Uh, Bill Opdyke and uh, Ralph Johnson, who was my former PhD advisor, uh, they wrote this paper, uh, and most people probably remember Ralph Johnson from his other work on design patterns. Like how, how many people are like, so Ralph Johnson is one of the gang of four authors of the design, famous design patterns book. Uh, and they wrote this pa paper in 1990 about how do we refactor from, 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 uh, from application code, how do we uh, extract abstractions and how do we create frameworks. And the birthplace of refactoring, I think, was um, at, at two institutions, at universities, and that were doing work on refactoring in parallel, concurrently, and independently of each other. So on one hand, at uh, University of Washington, uh, Bill Griswold, with, uh, with his advisor, with Dave Nockin, were looking at refactoring more in the context of restruct restructuring functional programs. So they were working with Scheme. And uh, at the same time, concurrently with them at University of Illinois, uh, Ralph Johnson was say, my, my former advisor and, and his um, PhD student, Bill Opdyke, were looking at refactoring in the object-oriented context for object-oriented systems, and especially in the context of frameworks. Uh, another influential work was carried by my f uh, former colleague, Don Roberts, again at the University of Illinois. I think he was the first one uh, whereas the, f the, the first two dissertations and research on refactoring was a little bit more, more theoretical. They had some proof of concepts, but a lot of this work was still theoretical. The work of Don Roberts was the first one that put refactoring tools in, in the hands of developers. So they did, uh, together with John Brandt, they did the first uh, commercial strength, industrial strength quality uh, refactoring tool that, that was adopted in Smalltalk. And it was, in fact, so influential that, that uh, Martin Fowler and Ken Beck from Extreme Program, when they saw this, they said, this is what we want. This is what every programmer should be using. And then they started to uh, talk about and, and, and to advertise uh, this work. And, and, and the work that Don Roberts did was so influential that, in fact, all of, all of the following refactoring tools and a lot of the growth on the tools that we have seen later on uh, was all uh, rooted in, in the work of Don Roberts. So um, this was also the decade when I was getting to be very interested in refactoring, and I was uh, reading about it. As I read Martin Fowler's book, I was uh, looking at who else is doing refactoring, and that's when I saw that Ralph Johnson was the champion of refactoring. That's when I um, contacted him, and I applied to do a PhD at the University of Illinois, and I uh, joined Illinois in 2001 to do a PhD. So uh, I also asked every single one of these champions 
Now, how was the world? How did it, what did it mean to do research on refactoring, you know, back there in the early days? And what they told me, it was a very hard. It was very hard because the community back then was uh, looking at refactoring and say, well, this sort of seems like, um, this sort of seems like, you know, like compiler transformations, yet, you know, you guys in refactoring don't give the guarantees, don't get the strong formalism that compilers give about transformation. So a lot of their papers was rejected. A lot of, it was a lot of training and rethinking, uh, a, a lot of training the community to, to think that there's a, a different interactive model of doing program transformations, which is very different than compilers. Uh, so, so we are very grateful today for all the work, for all the blood that they have spilled during those years, for all those papers that kept getting rejected and rejected and rejected uh, because the community was not ready to adopt a new, a new thinking approach. So today I want to uh, particularly focus on the most recent decade of refactoring, and this is uh, for several reasons. Um, first of all, it's because we sort of like know what happened. So we've seen a lot of growth that, that happened here uh, in the community. And uh, it, there was an influential paper, a survey paper by Tom Mans in 2004 that uh, talked about what happened in the refactoring field in, in that first decade. Um, so, so it's more interesting for me to look at what happened afterwards, uh, especially also because if you look at out of these uh, 2,800 refactoring papers since 1990s, uh, more than 80% of them, so about 2,400 papers, uh, have been published in this last decade. And there is also something very spe specific, something very particularly exciting and interesting to me about this last decade. If you look at this big, so you see, we see a, a huge growth here, and then was a big, and then was another growth that was even bigger and even more steep than before. So it's almost like a second birthplace, a second uh, birth, a second um, a sort of a renaissance of, of the field. So that's why I'm particularly even more excited to look at this, what happened in this last decade. So um, um, I say we are going to, I'm going to attempt to do a tour de force and to look at 2,400 research papers in this last decade. And uh, what I would like to do right now is for you to turn to your neighbor and to tell them, you know, fasten your seatbelt. Just, just, just go around and turn to your neighbor and say, fasten your seatbelt. Fasten your seatbelt. Because we, we are going to launch off, we are going to take off, we are going to look at, you know, 2,400 papers. Are you ready for that? Everyone with a, with a fastened seat belt? Okay, so, so I see the people are ready. And okay, so I'm going to press this special button here. I'm going to press this special button. We're going to take off. So before uh, I, I, I go into all this exciting growth, um, let me tell about the, uh, how we came up with this, with this research. So the work that I will present today, uh, especially in this part, has been done by my colleague Maroon Cassentini uh, from University of Michigan and his team of students. So I was simply an advisor and a consultant. Like when we, when we, when we, you hear me saying we did, it means that they did, Maroon and his students did. I was simply an advisor and consultant and I was asking them questions and, and, and probing and asking them to go deeper. But they are the ones actually who did, who did this work. Um, and it's, I'm, I'm very excited, again, this is fresh. I've never presented this before, and uh, um, you know this is still work in progress as we are doing this digging of this um, uh, last decade. So the way how we started, we searched for uh, for the keyword uh, refactoring, and we looked in uh, Scopus and Web of Science. So these are um, these are the main uh, fields of net. These are the main uh, sources of information. Also Thomas Reuters and other agencies who are looking at. Um, classifying and, and, and creating rankings of academic research and academic institutions. And a lot of other systematic literature reviews are, are using uh, Scopus and Web of Science, so that's why we chose this to start. And we look for the keywords refactoring or variations of refactoring, the, the, the refactor was also a variation of the root. Uh, and we wanted these keywords to appear in title, in the abstract, and also in the keywords. So um, uh, this yielded about uh, 3,000, 3,200 uh, refactoring papers. So then we said, okay, let's look at those that still meet what we call the definition of refactoring. So it's a transformation, it's a change in the code with, sort of, with some sort of behavioral preservation. And we went through a process where we manually validated every single of these uh, 3,000 papers. So four PhD students from uh, University of Michigan uh, manually look through this, so they read the title, the abstract, sometimes they had to read the content of the paper, 
and they had to vote between themselves independently whether they agreed this is a refactoring paper. And in cases where there was a disagreement, then a fifth uh, person, so Maroon Quesentino was the professor, uh, he also validated whether that, that paper was a refactoring paper. So that's why we think it's a, it's a high quality corpus of, of papers. So in the end, we ended up removing about 400 papers uh, because we felt that they were tangential. They were not, um, you know, they were mentioning refactoring, but they were not doing any advancement. They were, they were not in what we label as uh, refactoring papers. So uh, if we first look at who is publishing. So, so these uh, you know, 2,400 papers were published by uh, 4,900, uh, so close to 5,000 uh, authors, distinct authors. Uh, but we have also seen that not everyone is equal. So there is a lot of breadth in the community, but there also there's a lot of depth. So there are some authors who, are, um, uh, who, who publish much more and have an influence which is uh, much, much, much broader than, um, than the other authors. So in particular, we look at what's the influence, like who are these leaders? Who are the people who have an influence in the community? And uh, uh, what you see here on, on, on the bars is the number of citations and then the uh, orange dots are the number of refactoring papers that have published in this um, last decade that have garnered those <coughs> citations. So here on the left hand side we see people like myself and my former advisor Ralph Johnson who are you know, fairly established in the field so we, 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 we have lots of citations and lots of influence and also a large number of publications uh, and, and this doesn't surprise us because this is our core area, this is, this is what we've been working for decades, especially I say Ralph is, is the champion of the field, he's the pillar of the field, he's the is the foundation, as I, I, sh I, should, I should call him. Um, but also what's very surprising to look at is a particular interest to this community are these people um, that I'm highlighting that are very well known in this community. So people like, like Sven Appel and Christian Kastner and, and Don Batori and uh, Langor and Kuleman, uh, these are all names from your community. These are all people that you know. And uh, uh, what's surprising to me is that if you're looking uh, these are, these are, their work is on software product lines, uh, working with uh, refactoring with models. Um, and what's important to me, the lessons that I have for this is that if you want to grow your field, you want to attract champions from other communities. You want to have people that are crossing the boundaries from a community A into community B. And these are the people who come uh, exciting, they bring new fresh ideas. These are the people who, uh, if you look at just look at, at Christian Kastner. So if you look at his total number of publications in refactoring the last, in the last decade, it's much more than mine. It's just five compared to my 37. But look at his influence. So these, his five papers have you know, hundreds of citations. So the lesson here is that if you are moving from one community to another and you are a champion in one community, you can, you can be very influential in another community because you are the person who understands and crosses the bridge between, between both communities. And the corollary is, again, that, that you don't have to publish a lot of papers in your new host community um, be, because you are the first one, you're one of the pioneers who are crossing between communities. Lots of people will pay attention to what you're doing. So a second lesson, um, if you want to grow and if you want to, to, to expand your community, uh, you need to open to accept new ideas. So on the x-axis, again, we have the timeline going from in the last decade. And these lines represent different areas of focus in, in this last decade of refactoring. So the original focus of refactoring from 1990s was how can we automate software changes? How we can automate these refactorings? So that's still the number one, that's still the number one goal. But if you look at there's a lot of papers that are published and, and they have uh, further moved the refactoring field beyond the original uh, focus of automating changes. And of particular interest to us is, is the second one, is refactoring insight. And these are papers who are looking at how can we give insight to the developers at where in the code they should refactor. So this makes sense to see a lot of growth in this area. Uh, if you think about as we are working with code bases that are getting older and older, uh, whose developers are no longer there, maybe left the company long time ago or, or died or who, who knows how they went away, uh, a lot of that insight, a lot of, uh, a lot of that domain expertise and domain knowledge that we fought in the beginning in the field that, you know, it comes from the, from the head of the developer is no longer available. So, so what we need, um, these people have realized, these researchers have realized that a lot of these developers are not familiar with the code. They need insight. They need understanding of where in the code uh, 
uh, they need to refactor. So that's why uh, we have seen a, a, such a huge increase because they have paid attention to the needs of, of today's developers. A lot of increases also come up in the field of testing the correctness uh, of refactoring tools. And again, this is in a way non-surprising. Um, you know, for industrial developers, they are very concerned. You know, everything that they do, it's, it's all a cost analysis. It's all, if I change the code today, what is the risk of introducing new bugs, introducing regressions, uh, versus, you know, doing something that is going to improve the design of the code and is going to, 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 to make the code more usable in the future, right? So, so it's very important to them that this transformation, these changes, um, have a well-intended semantics and are indeed doing what they are supposed to do. So a lot of the growth has happened on how can we test the correctness of these refactoring tools. Um, another uh, big area of recent fo focus has been on prioritizing. So when we have these tools that are harnessing and gathering insight and are telling developers this is where you should refactor the code, sometimes, you know, the developer can be overwhelmed with hundreds of recommendations. So, so lots of researchers have picked up on that and say, how can we prioritize? How can we give suggestions, but how can we rank them so that the developer doesn't have to sift through hundreds of these recommendations, but only focus on the ones that have the most, um, you know, bang on the buck, most return on investment. And uh, um, uh, th there are a few other um, uh, areas that have seen a lot of growth. So, so the key lesson here is that uh, to grow a community, you need to be open to new ideas. So our refactoring field grew so much because we, uh, we kept looking at what are the needs of the people who are serving. So we are looking at what are the needs of refactoring users in the real world, and, and we saw how they need insight, how they need prioritization, how they need assurance, uh, and that's where a lot of growth in the last decade has come up from. Another uh, lesson, another uh, observation that I take from this growth has been, um, you know, there's, there's been a tremendous emphasis on, 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 on moving beyond the target of code, uh, moving also to, to target other things of, related to software. So the original intent of refactoring was to change the code, but what's surprising is that the refactoring that are changing the models have seen a huge increase. Um, refactoring that change architecture, lots of people have been picking up on, on, on how do we change the data uh, representation, the databases, the user interfaces of, of our software. Uh, and that's, that's another observation. Like, you need to be open to new ideas. You need to embrace um, um, uh, this new interest. And uh, this is where we saw a lot of other growth coming from. Um, we also looked at what's, what's the intent. Why are people refactoring? So the original motivation for refactoring, if you remember from Martin Fowler's definition, was, was to improve the internal quality, to improve the design, to make the software more readable, more maintainable in the long run. And uh, uh, what's very surprising is that starting with about 2010, a lot of, of, of the work and a lot of the objectives of refactoring have been beyond improving maintainability, have been also on improving performance. So performance now dominates the number one objective in the refactoring community. And um, uh, looking back why this happens, it's sort of like it makes sense. Uh, the way how I'm explaining it myself is that for academics, it's easier to sell and it's easier to market performance than maintainability, right? So with maintainability is, you know, if I tell you I'm making a change in the code and believe me, in a couple of years or in maybe three, four, five years, you know, this code is going to be easier to maintain, it's very hard to sell that argument. But if I tell you, you know, here I made a change in the code and it's improving the performance by 12% or it's, or it's improving responsiveness by a certain percentage, it's, it's, it's tangible, it's measurable, it has an immediate impact, it, it is visible to end users. Right, so, so I think, you know, people naturally picked up on performance because it's, it's easier to market and it's easier to sell. Uh, lots of new work uh, has been coming up in the area of, of security and migration. So how can we ensure that if you are, um, if you are migrating code um, from a language to another, from a, from a programming model to another programming model, uh, how do we ensure that, that certain uh, functionalities are still preserved? Uh, what happens when we are, um, what happens when we are um, um, integrating different modules? Do we preserve the safety guarantees in terms of security? Uh, does our application still has the same uh, security footprint that it had before? Right? So we see a lot of a lot of new growth in the field because people have been looking beyond just improving internal quality, have been looking again what what do end users care in the real world? 
So the fifth observation is um, we looked at uh, what is the sort of, you know, how are, what are the techniques that people, you know, how are they doing their research? What sort of techniques do they use? And we found that the bread and butter, static and dynamic analysis is still the bread and butter. So lots of people are still using uh, compiler sort of representations, abstract syntax trees and, and uh, uh, binding information and then uh, call graphs and so forth. And, you know, the people who go the extra mile and do fancier stuff with uh, more sophisticated program analysis and abstractions uh, such as, you know, uh, flow-based and um, uh, points to analysis and, and, and heap-based analysis and uh, interprocedural fancy analysis. So, so that's still, you know, the bread and butter. But if you look at um, uh, where there's been a lot of new, in, in, uh, a new growth and a lot of new exciting techniques being used is, is using techniques from the search field. And uh, the people who are looking at gathering insight, of giving recommendations, of, of mining uh, open source repositories to gain insight and, and provide recommendations are using lots of techniques from the mining software repositories, from data mining. Uh, lots of people are using genetic algorithms and, and other techniques, multi-objective search functions that have been uh, very scalable in the last few years. And of course, a lot of techniques, uh, a lot of growth has been coming also from, uh, from, from the data mining itself, as this has been, you know, big data is everywhere. And, and, and you know, we think that also it made a, it, it, it left its footmark also in our field. So, um, how do we know that, there's another question is, how do we know that this research work? Like what, what, how do people in the community, how do, they, how do they establish, how do they give themselves the confidence and how do they convince the others that their research work? So a lot of established uh, empirical evaluations in the field, uh, very little analytical evaluation in terms of proofs and uh, proofs of correctness, mostly empirical evaluation. But when you're looking at empirical evaluation, we see two sorts. We see the ones, the, the community uh, is using a lot of uh, open source data, uh, people who are um, applying refactoring patches on some open source project and are sending those patches to the developers, or people who are replicating some refactorings that happen uh, along the version histories of some projects and then compare uh, how the developers carry those changes by hand versus how they have carried those changes by tools. So that's, that's, that's most of the techniques that these people are using. But what I'm very excited to see, it's a lot of growth in the area of using industrial data. And the reason why I'm excited about this is because I think this is much harder to do. So working with industry code, working with industrial users, it's much harder than working with open source. Uh, a researcher has to go the extra mile, has to be much more intentional, has to be much more focused, has to be much more, ta much more targeted to get their hands upon such codes. Um, but I think in the end, this is where we have the longest impact. This is where we have a legacy. This is where we have an impact on the practice of software development. So um, we've, we've seen people doing all sorts of different levels of collaboration with industry. So at the first level, it's a lot of papers who are looking at just surveying practitioners and looking at uh, what are the needs of practitioners. So Miriam Kim and other people have been looking at, at Microsoft. Uh, doing surveys with how do developers at Microsoft, what's their perception of refactoring. But then we've seen other people who are validating their codes or going the extra mile, validating their code on industrial code bases or working closely with industrial partners. And of course, the highest level, you know, the, the, the people who go the extra mile are those who are moving their tools into the hands and transferring them into the hands of practitioners. So uh, tools, refactoring tools that have been licensed to industry, or have been adopted in official industry products, uh, such as uh, famous IDs. Uh, so, so when you have, when you move to this level, then you give these tools and put them into the hands of real users. So uh, if you remember, uh, I talked about, uh, there was a big spike that happened in the middle of, uh, where was that, in the middle of, um, if you remember here, it's this big spike, like sort of like a, almost a second uh, birth of refactoring that happened from 2010, 12, uh, 11, and especially 12, and, and going up. So we were curious about what what happened there. And we looked at the papers that were published in 2012 and those that were published in 2013 to see where is this new growth coming. So a lot of growth has been coming from model refactoring. Hundreds of papers uh, published in, by, by this community and by other communities on, on the refactoring of models. Uh, new, new exciting 
uh, interest on refactoring for performance or for parallelism, um, giving insight, refactoring opportunities, uh, cloud and, and web related uh, refactoring has also seen a lot of growth. Uh, so this is, this is encouraging. This was um, good news for us to see that, that you know, the community picks up on new domains, you know, expands and moves beyond the current established uh, frontiers of refactoring. So if I was to summarize uh, what enabled this growth, uh, if you remember in the beginning, the, the focus was on the internal structure. Uh, objectives was to make the code easier to understand, so it's improving internal structure uh, and also preserving external behavior. And we have seen that a significant expansion of the field came up from uh, expanding the focus, the target of refactoring, looking beyond. Um, so, so the focus of research is no longer just simply automation, but it's also providing insight, testing, uh, prioritizing changes. Uh, now we are looking at uh, artifacts, other artifacts beyond code. We are looking at models. We are looking at architecture, UIs, and, and databases. Uh, we are looking at not only to uh, improve internal quality, but also to improve other non-functional uh, characteristics, such as performance and security and usability. And um, um, we have also seen also a definition, a, a slight uh, a migration towards um, this is no longer about preserving behavior, but it's about preserving the intended, the proper behavior, and changing the improper behavior. So in terms of security, for example, when we make the software more secure, you, know, you debate, is this a refactoring? So it is, because the intended use of the correct use of the software is still preserved. The unintended, the hackable use of the software is eliminated. So in that sense, behavioral preservation is about the intended part of the, of, of the code, and the, um, uh, you know, refactoring is allowed to make some behavioral changes by eliminating or by reducing the unintended behavior of the code. So, so the takeaway message here is that the host communities that thrive are those that are open and are accepting new ideas. So we have been opening and accepting a lot of, of, of wealth of new ideas in the field. Uh, here are some other factors that contributed to the growth of the field, and these are mostly on the social part. Uh, I'm calling this uh, more of a community engineering, um, and this is where we've seen you need both. You need both technical and also on the social uh, part to enable and sustain such tremendous growth. So first of all, an uh, important lesson is attracting these industrial champions. So we have seen that the field of research has really taken off after people like Martin Fowler published the book, uh, people like Ken Beck and Warren Cunningham, who are the inventors of extreme programming, starting going all over, all around and, and telling people that, that the refactoring is a crucial, it's an important part of everyday software development. So attracting those industry champions have been tremendously beneficial in our field. Um, also, I would like to say that, that you know, for us, most people in the academic community, we are very excited about publishing papers, and we need to partner with people who have complementary skills. So people who are good at building tools, people who are build, good at building communities, people who are, who are good at curating, uh, those are the people that we need to partner with. And in our community, we have seen this very successful partnership. So John Brand that I mentioned before is an amazing uh, academic, but you know, had he not partnered with John Brand, who is probably the best software developer that I know in the world, you know, maybe, maybe his work wouldn't have been so influential. We have also seen in the Eclipse community, so another classic example is Frank Tip, who is, an, who is more sort of an academic. You know, he worked for IBM Research. He was publishing tons of papers on refactoring, and he partnered all the time with the Eclipse uh, JDT tools, who are til tool builders. These guys were amazingly good at building tools, and, and you know, this partnership was very, uh, very fruitful for both sides. Uh, it also takes a mindset, and it takes... Uh, it takes of being proactive and being intentional to have this industrial impact. Uh, it also takes um, uh, sharing and having a shared platform. Uh, and in our community, for better or for worse, we have embraced Eclipse. Um, and, and there were many good reasons why I embraced Eclipse. So first of all, it was open source, but also was, was backed up by a company, was professionally developed by IBM. They had yearly milestone major releases. They, you know, IBM was pretty much running it as a, as, a, as, a, as a professional industrial strength software, and the source code was all available for us. It was very easy for us to read the source code. It was, yes, it was fully documented, but you know, how we compensated for that is, is that we went to this. Uh, we, were, we were sharing with each other. We were reading each other's codes. We were reading each other's refactoring plugins, and that's how um, uh, 
uh, we were we were learning from each other. There was an active and very very open and very active uh, developer forum, and lots of people were asking questions on the forums, and lots of people eager to uh, help other newcomers. So we created these ecosystems uh, with researchers supporting uh, the Eclipse team, but also you know vice versa, with Eclipse team supporting us, and all of us contributing to this shared uh, infrastructure on, on Eclipse. It, it was it was I think it was a crucial foundational uh, uh, artifact that contributed to the growth of the field. Uh, people have also been doing other analysis frameworks, and again, they be became you know, the sort of the standard de facto uh, frameworks in the community. Uh, the IBM guys were developing Walla, and then more on, community, on the academic side was the Sud guys. So lots of people in our community are using those frameworks. Uh, I also want to talk about some of the community efforts, community infrastructure, and, and how do we engineer this community. And uh, um, I think this is, this is an aspect that should not be underemphasized. So we had about seven refactoring workshops and a doctoral seminar, and I organized the first four refactoring workshops. And I remember distinctively at the first one that, we organ that I organized was, a, was the refactoring workshop in 2007, co-located with ECUP. Uh, we had about 50 people coming up and attending, and about 32 of them had, had papers and posters. And the idea that I had then was, uh, let's have these people present in front of the whole ECUP community. So when ECUP had their posters day, uh, every single one of our refactoring guys, you know, displayed their posters at ECUP. So then I heard all these conversations on the hallways at ECUP. It's actually like two-thirds of the ECUP posters were refactoring posters. So people were talking about what happens, you know, everyone at ECUP is working on refactoring now. So it was sort of like, you know, taking by storm or taking, you know, by, by, uh, by, by surprise the whole community and just, you know, being very bold and being very active in, in talking about our work and getting feedback from others. Um, I was also very intentional at all these workshops. We invited all the major ID providers. So we invited the Eclipse uh, refactoring team. We invited uh, the NetBean guys, the IntelliJ IDEA, um, uh, Microsoft Visual Studio guys. And as I said, their tools were not so well documented, but they all came to these workshops. Uh, people asked them questions. They all talked about, okay, this is how you do this. This is how you do that thing. You know, this is just like, you know, a couple of two lines or three lines that are doing amazing <laughs> things. You just need these, these two lines that are, are, are solving your whole problem. So all of this was, was happening. All those discussions were happening, and people were sharing these tips and tricks from coming and attending these events together. And, and the reason why we had these discussions is because we invited the ID providers to come there, and, and, and they had, you know, they had for sure, they had the microphone, they had... Uh, they had access to, uh, to this whole community. Uh, I also realized that a community cannot thrive uh, if it doesn't grow, if it doesn't expand the leaders. So while I was the original organizer, I organized the first four refactoring workshops, I was intentionally bringing other people and growing new leaders uh, and, and other people who were involved in the leadership so that that's how the community expanded, that's how the community grew. <clears throat> so um, let me switch now to the second part of my talk, where I'm going to give some examples from my own personal, um, from my own personal uh, uh, journey as a research group and how what are some of the refactoring work that we've been doing in the area of mobile. So how many people have a smartphone with you today? Okay, so I see that most most people have. Um, mine mine it's there in the bag. I didn't want to have any interruption, so I left it there. So um, uh, mobile indeed has seen a huge growth. Uh, in fact, this year it is expected, like Gartner predicts, there will be like 300 billion apps that will be downloaded this year alone. So, um, um, uh, however, the number one problem that plagues mobile devices today um, is, is because they, they have sort of, um, uh, you know, compared to, to desktops and, and, and Powerful computers have you know, much limited resources, yet they make uh, um, excessive networking accesses. So what happens often is that these screens get frozen like this, and when they when they froze, uh, you know, frustrated frustrated user like the way I'm frustrated right now. So these slow operations that are freezing the UI are the number one uh, problem uh, with with mobile apps today. And a recent paper found that up to 75% of the performance problems in the top-rated Android apps arise because of frozen uh, UIs that are frustrating the users. So what causes these user interfaces to become frozen on a mobile platform? Why are these apps unresponsive? So 
every single uh, SDK for mobile programming today is based on events. It's an event-driven model, and where we have lots of events that are generated when we are touching the screen, when we are changing the screen orientation, when we are moving, when we are walking, accelerometer, and the GPS also picks up events and generate events in the system. And then the programmer, to respond to these events, they write uh, event handlers that are, handling, that are handling the response of what happens when one of these events gets triggered. So here I'm simulating what happens when we have an interface and we press on a button. So a new event on click is added to our event queue. And there is one single thread, the user interface thread, that takes one of these events one by one and processes them sequentially. So suppose now that one of these events uh, on start involves uh, accessing a slow operation, a long running slow operation like a cloud access. And uh, when we are invoking this cloud access, if you're doing this over a slow network, uh, the user interface thread can no longer respond to other events, and that's when we get these sort of screens that are, apps are going to be frozen. Anyone here have ever, ever, ever used an app that got a frozen, frozen screen and a frozen user interface? Okay, lots of people. So I see smiley faces right now, but probably you're not smiling back then. <laughs> so <coughs> the, the way how we deal with this is, is to move this long-running slow operation, to move it in the background, in a background thread. We execute it asynchronously. So now the user interface thread um, dispatches this in the background. When this operation has finished, it calls back in the main UI thread with the main result. And meanwhile, because the user interface is, is available and it's, 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 it's free, it can process other events, and that's what keeps the apps uh, responsive. So that's really the, the, the secret. That's what, it's, it's a well-known technique. Um, this is how we take something that is long running and, and make it non-blocking and run it in the background. <coughs> However, refactoring the code to go from synchronous to asynchronous uh, is non-trivial. It's a different programming model. It requires thinking about these callbacks. You are no longer calling a function and assuming that you get the result immediately, but you, you have to think about registering a callback. So it's, it's non-trivial to do these refactorings. It is also, even once you arrived in the landscape of asynchronous programming, it's non-trivial non to stay there. You still need to make other changes. And one example is to modernize existing async code. So for example, um, on some platforms, for example, Microsoft no longer supports the old style of callbacks, asynchronous code, and it forces developers uh, to use a new style of asynchronous programming. If you want to upgrade your app to use Microsoft Surface or a, or a certain version of the operating system, then you have to upgrade to this new programming model. So again, this is another refactoring, and this is non-trivial again. Uh, programmers have to preserve the behavior. They have to preserve the order of the exceptions that are thrown. Uh, more, more trouble ahead. Even while you are in the landscape of asynchronous programming, uh, you still have to change your code to make it more performant. So we have seen uh, lots of uh, supposedly uh, good-looking asynchronous code that instead of making the code more performant actually hurts performance. So we have seen uh, in the top-rated Android apps, we have seen that 4% of the code has asynchronous uh, syntax but still runs blocking, still, uh, still, still runs synchronously. Um, and again, changing the code to deal, you know, to make it more performant, to improve responsiveness, again, non-trivial, again, can be seen as a, uh, we've been approaching it as a refactoring problem. Another example is to change the code from a short-running asynchronous construct uh, to encapsulate uh, long-running asynchronous construct. So if you are misusing this, if you are misusing a short-running asynchronous construct, in fact, you can end up with memory leaks in Android, uh, you can end up with lost results. You compute something that you can never display to, on the user interface, and it's simply, it's essentially, you just wasted energy uh, bringing something on the cloud that you never display to the user. So um, again, this, is, this can be seen as a refactoring problem, and in this case, the, the challenge is uh, converting the program from a, a programming model which is stateful, which is communicating via shared memory, into a completely different programming model Whereas in Android, this resembles more like shared, in more like distributed memory programming where there is a channel of communication and, and broadcasting messages, and, and that's, that's how we communicate information. Again, we can look at this as a refactoring problem. So my group has been automating several of these vectors of refactoring, some of them for Android, some of them for .NET. Uh, but today, I will not have time to talk about all of them. I will probably just give you a very... Um, a very light overview of, of some of the ones that we've been doing in the .NET. 
So this is some work. <coughs> and again, I'm, I'm going to very, uh, just give you a few slides so that you get a taste of what it means to automate some of these refactorings. Um, this is some work that's been done by a PhD student, Sammy Ocker, who uh, visited Microsoft and did an internship at Microsoft and then came back with lots of fresh new ideas from the, from the company and then um, worked on this and then uh, finished and graduated and is now full-time working at Microsoft. So a uh, collaborative project with, with Ari Van Dorsen and his student David Hartwell from, uh, from uh, TU Delft. And uh, we presented this at the ICSI conference uh, three years ago in, in Hyderabad, India, and we're very fortunate that this paper was very well received. We got an award. So a little bit on, on, on how callbacks looks like in .NET. So I intentionally made this code small enough that you cannot read, but it suffices to know that all that this code is doing this is essentially taking a picture and sending it to a server asynchronously. And look at how complicated. These are all callbacks that you have to deal with. And, and uh, this code is, is, you know, if you think it's ugly, it's not even ugly enough because I have not even shown here the exception handling code. So if I was to throw that in, that would be even more complex. Like then all of this junk of code for just like taking a picture and sending it asynchronously to a server. So, so these callbacks inverse the control flow. Um, they obfuscate the intent of the original program. Uh, it's, it's the reason why when you have to think about um, building your project from modules and libraries that all are using asynchrony, it becomes a nightmare. It's what people call the callback hell. So Microsoft uh, decided to fix these things and uh, to eliminate these callback disadvantages, C Sharp 5 introduced this uh, keywords, pair of keywords, async and await which makes uh, asynchronous programming a first-class citizen. So essentially, if you put async as the keyword modifier in front of the method, then you mark this as a special method, and then inside of the method, you can put the await, which is essentially telling the compiler, this is where I'm going to uh, await, this is where I'm going to resume, I'm going to relinquish the access, so the control flow goes back to the caller of this method, and then uh, this is the place, this is the pause place at which point when the result is available, it comes back and the, and, and, and the control flow resumes from that point in the program. So with just a couple of simple keywords, async and await, you no longer have to use callbacks. You know, the code, asynchronous code, deceptively looks very, very similar with the original synchronous code. So the motivation for our study was uh, we do not want how developers are using these asynchrony constructs in practice, uh, especially these new ones, the sync and await. And uh, we knew that there, is, there were little tools back then. In fact, uh, there were almost none that was particularly looking at the sync and await. So we wanted to see what are some opportunities to improve the tool support uh, with respect to a sync and await. So we first conducted a first large scale formative study. This is where we looked at how are people using or overusing or misusing or underusing this asynchronous construct. And based on this, um, we found out, uh, based on the insights that we came up with, we designed a refactoring tool called Asyncifier, uh, which helps developers to convert from old legacy style of asynchronous call to this modern async and await. And also based on the formative study, um, we found that lots of people are still misusing this new, brand new async and await. So we came up with some program transformation tool, Corrector, uh, which, which uh, corrects a lot of the improper usages of async and await. So in our formative study, we analyzed more than a thousand um, open source apps uh, that were on the Windows phone. <coughs> in total, they were, can I, can I use this water? Is this mine? Yeah. Okay. Just have something for my throat. Much better. <coughs> so in total, we analyzed like about 12 million lines of code. Of course, we could not analyze this by hand. So we built upon the Microsoft Rosalind, uh, which is a compiler infrastructure for C Sharp. And uh, what, what we found out was um, developers are heavily uh, relying on callbacks. So even though Microsoft introduced this a few years ago, the async and await, uh, most of the code is still using the old legacy style of, of callbacks. Uh, despite the fact that Microsoft no longer supported this, it no longer recommends using it, and in fact, even prohibits. So if your, uh, if your app back in 2014 was targeting Surface or Windows 8, you were forced by Microsoft actually to upgrade to use, um, get rid of these callbacks and to use async and await. 
So based on this, we, we designed this refactoring tool that goes from callbacks uh, to a sync and await, and this is non-trivial. It has a lot of uh, challenges that we, we present in our refactoring paper in ICSI 2014. Um, and, and this, um, uh, we built and released this tool, a syncifier, uh, which upgrades this um, old style to the newer style of working with asynchronous code. So uh, we also found out that lots of people are still misusing even the new async and await construct. So we found uh, frequent underuse, uh, but also misuse and abuse of async and await. And that's why we built this other tool, Corrector, which uh, helps developers to correct and to fix these uh, misused instances of async and await. So Corrector works in two modes. In the uh, batch mode, it can work in the background, can scan all these uh, erroneous usages of async and await, and can give a list of recommendations and a transformation on the code. Or it can work interactively uh, as a quick assist tool, and as the programmer is, is, is typing and changing the code, it constantly scans and it highlights when the programmer just made uh, um, an error related to asynchrony. So for the empirical evaluation, we use the same large corpus that we had before. Uh, and we ask several questions, are these tools applicable? And the answer is a very strong, emphatic, very bold yes. We applied them thousands of times successfully on, on millions of lines of code. Um, what is the impact on productivity? So just to give you uh, an idea, uh, each refactoring on average changes about 29 lines of code. It has to change, and these are all non-trivial lines of code. It has to reason interprocedurally, has to go through third-party library code. So this is non-trivial. It's not just simply no monkey typing at the keyboard. This requires a lot of um, uh, sustained thinking, a lot of concentrated focus from the developer. Uh, and, and the tool can do this in less than about two seconds, which makes it interactive, of course. The one that I'm very curious about is what do developers, what do end users think about these tools? So to evaluate this, we choose uh, 10 most recently updated um, apps that have callbacks from our corpus. Uh, we applied our refactoring tool, a syncifier, on these uh, tools and sent 28 refactoring uh, uh, patches. Uh, and nine out of 10 apps uh, accepted our refactoring patches. And their response was, was very uh, welcoming. For example, the developers of OSER, which is the Twitter app for .NET, uh, thanked us for the, uh, for the patch, for the refactoring. They were looking forward to the public release of the tool. So we've done something similar with the corrector tool. We chose uh, 20 of the most recently updated apps that had a code with, uh, related to async and await. And we ran our corrector tool, and we found hundreds of um, uh, instances where the tool applied patches. We sent every single one of them, uh, so this for 20, 288 uh, patches. Uh, we sent them to the developers, and they accepted every single one of them. And their reaction was, again, very, uh, very positive. They say that, uh, thank you so much. Uh, what you point is, is correct. The performance has improved by a factor of two. So what's even more important is that we went beyond this and we work with Microsoft and our corrector shifted to the official list of Visual Studio. So if you are using Visual Studio, uh, you have access to this tool. You don't have to download it from our uh, website. Okay, so um, uh, how are we doing with time? I have 10 minutes? Okay, she'll give me 20 more minutes. <laughs> no, 10, 10 minutes, okay. Good, so in the, in the last, is it 10 to 15 minutes? So in the last part of the talk, uh, this is the third and the last part of the talk, and you guys have been, you know, sort of like very courageous. I, you, you, you lasted through that uh, marathon of 2,400 refactoring papers, so you are now experts on refactoring. You know what has happened in the last decade. Uh, you have seen some of the work that we have done. Uh, so, so I, I commend you for you know being so um, uh, staying so strong in the race. So I'm coming now to this third part of my talk, and this is where I want to talk about some of the reflections, some of the lessons that I'm learning right now in my career and also in my professional life. And uh, I want to share some of these lessons with you. So, um, you know, some of these are behind the scenes. Some of the things that I'm sharing with you I never shared before. And I'm very excited because I hope that you can learn from them. I, I, I really have a mindset and I really have an attitude that I want other people to be successful. And why do I want to do this? Why, why, would, I, why would I want to share some of my secret sauce with you? Uh, it all started because uh, one day I, I opened up my eyes and I looked and in front of me there was a whiteboard 
on the whiteboard, it says today's date is August 5, 2015. This is the Good Samaritan Hospital in Corvallis, Oregon. So I say, why, why am I in Corvallis, Oregon? I thought I'm in Illinois. And why, uh, why, why am I in the hospital? So I asked the nurse, you know, why I'm in the hospital? She said, I had a bicycle crash. I didn't remember anything on the bicycle crash. In fact, I didn't remember many more important things in my life. I didn't remember how many children I had or what was their birthday. I was very fortunate to remember my wife. When she walked into the room, I asked her, you know, honey, where I am and why I'm here? And she said, you had the bicycle crash and the ambulance found you and, and go to the hospital. So by the time that she finishes this, and I look at her, you know, with, 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 with candor in my eyes and ask her again, you know, honey, why I'm here and where I am? And she said the same thing. You know, you had the bicycle crash. Uh, uh, and then you got to the hospital, and then I look again, uh, I look at, again at her and say, you know, why I'm here? And she said the same thing. So, you know, then, then she starts crying. So she realized that something is messed up with my brain. So during this brain concussion, um, during this accident, I suffered a severe brain concussion, which has lost, lost my short-term memory. So my memory was resetting every two minutes or so. So if you've ever seen the movie 50 First Dates, Anyone sitting in the 51st dates? It was a woman who goes through a, a car accident and her memory resets overnight, so in the morning she has to watch a videotape to remember. You know, for me, it was about every two minutes. So um, while I was going through that, through weeks and months of brain recovery, uh, while uh, my brain was going through this fogginess and was, was healing, uh, at the same time, those were some of the best moments, some of the best clarity in my whole mind. Some of the, for the first time in my whole life, I could see the big picture. I could see where I was going. I could see where I was headed. I could see that on one hand, I was very successful professionally. I was academically, I was uh, getting all the recognition in the field. But on the other hand, I could see very clear for the first time in my life that it was all about me. It was all about my personal success. It was all about how can other people serve me? How can other people make me more successful? So I realized that, that I want to live a different life. If I was giving a second chance to life, I don't want to live life the same way how I lived it before. So that's why I'm telling you these stories. That's why I'm sharing you with this with you. Uh, every day I'm learning now, how can I use my experiences? How can I use what I gain to make other people successful? So if I was to give this talk you know, two years ago, I would have never shared anything of this with you because you know, it was all about me. And you know, the more that I was successful, the better it was for me. But now I'm learning you know, how can I take what I know how can I take the shapes, the experience that have shaped my, my life, and how can I pour, how can I build others? How can other people are successful? And that's where I'm learning to live a life beyond personal success, a life where I'm moving into, into increased significance, where I'm helping other people become successful. So that's why I'm, as I'm sharing today these lessons with you. Is it, is it fine if I do this today with you? Yeah. Okay. So the first lesson that I want to share is that I've been learning that I need to stay in my strength zone, but constantly reinvent myself. So people keep telling us, oh, you need to be good in everything. You need to be excellent in everything in life. And this is just like uh, really bad advice, because if we are excellent in everything, we are essentially becoming experts in everything. We become experts in nothing. We become mediocre of everything in life. So the, 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 the recipe to success is not to become expert in everything, is to be aware of many things so that you can make connections, but is to truly focus and become an e excellent and excel at a few things. So let me share some of my stories with refactoring. So in, in, let's say in, in 2001, when I joined Ralph Johnson to do a PhD in refactoring, I was working in this area of how can we use refactoring technology to upgrade library code that have gone through refactoring and now all the applications are, that are built up on this library code on these APIs are broken. How can we migrate these applications so that they are compatible with the refactoring that have happened on the APIs of these libraries? And, and I, I got very excited. I got deep into the guts of Eclipse. I became a contributor to Eclipse. I learned a lot. I, I became so excited. A lot of my work ended up in, in official release of Eclipse. I was super excited. And by the time that I finished my PhD dissertation, I realized that the world has changed. So this was now 2007. Intel stopped producing single core um, processors. Everything was now multi-cores. Um, if we were to squeeze performance and if we were to benefit from Moore's law, the only way to benefit is to resort to parallelism. So that's when I took everything that I knew from the previous world, from static analysis and everything that I've done with Eclipse before, and I, I, I moved into this domain of refactoring for parallelism where we worked on how can we improve responsive? How can we improve the throughput? How can we improve the scalability of already parallel code? 
how can we add multi-threading in single-threaded code via refactoring? So I said it was a challenge because it forced me to go even deeper. It forced me to go even way beyond uh, of, of, the, of the scale of problems that I work with and, and reason about uh, heaps and reason about shared memory uh, and about how, how read and act, read and write accesses are happening and, 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 and uh, uh, data races and, and, and deadlocks and all these other uh, nasty problems that come with parallelism. And I was very happy again. I made you know, significant impact in that domain. And yet, when I just thought that you know, I have arrived or I felt that you know, I really, I really got, you know, got to do a dent in the field, you know, the world has changed again. So I looked at my in-laws and they stopped using desktops and laptops. Everything that they're using now is iPads and, and, and mobile. And um, this is what the end user community has moved toward. They have given up on these uh, dinosaur artifacts that we still have on our tables, and, and they are uh, looking into this, um, carrying all this computing technology with them in their pocket every day. So I've been, again, it forces me to go back and, and push further beyond my original work on refactoring for uh, parallelism. Now I've been uh, mostly looking now, now beyond that at event-driven model, at, at completely different program model, at, at looking at you know, stateful and stateless execution. So again, has been challenging me, has been pushing me out of my comfort zone, uh, working with, with, with you know, uh, fi fixing bugs, fixing uh, erroneous misusage of these asynchronous constructs, and I just gave you a very brief overview of some of that work. So um, the lesson from this is that many times I try to venture out of refactoring. And I try to venture in, in fields that I know that I'm weak. So I venture in, in I dabble a little bit in HCI and I failed miserably uh, because I was not wired, I was not designed, that was not my core strength. So I realized that my core strength is to work on principles of changing programs between different programming models. How do we change programs from sequential to parallel? How do we change programs from from, from, from synchronous to asynchronous, from stateful to stateless execution. That's what I excelled, that's what I was good at. That's what, when I worked in my core strength area, that's when I was uh, very successful. That's when I uh, was, was, was you know, making you know, significant uh, impact. So what I realized is that I need to stay in my strength zone and to work in my strength zone and work with others in the, in the things that I have weaknesses. So now I no longer try to be expert on everything. I simply try to collaborate with many more people. Um, another lesson that I've been learning is uh, you need to find out, identify what's your dream. So if you think about what do you really, 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 really want? Like, do you know for yourself? So for me, what I really, really, really wanted was to make an impact on the real world, on the lives of software developers. So for example, several of the work that we've done in the area of automating program transformations and refactorings are now shipping up with official lists of Eclipse, with NetBeans, with Visual Studio, with Android Studio, we are working now with Google. Some of the work that we have, all these refactoring transformations and patches, uh, we have sent to famous open source projects and have been accepted and have improved those open source products. Um, I was fortunate to work on the first open source refactoring engine for Java. And, and then I was contributing to other ideas. Um, the work that we've done in the area of inferring where transformations took place in the code has been now used at big companies such as Google and IBM and many other research labs all over the world. Uh, the work that we've done on testing refactoring engines and refactoring infrastructure is now used in the official testing infrastructure at Oracle in the ID. Um, some of the work that we've done on understanding how developers are using concurrency and how using parallelism have shaped and have influenced the official release of these uh, public uh, official concurrent libraries in, this, in these platforms. And uh, I, I was fortunate again to work um, and, and, and to support a lot of the growth in the community. So why I'm telling you all of this, I'm not telling you this to impress you, but to impress upon you the idea that once you figure out what you really, really, really want to do, you need to stay focused, you need to be intentional, you need to be proactive about it. None of these things has happened by, by accident, by chance. If you think that, you know, we just publish a paper and, you know, hopefully Microsoft is going to run over it or hof hopefully, you know, Google is going to run into it and, you know, they're going to take it and, and make a product out of it, you know. It has never happened to me. Maybe it has happened to other people there in the world. I, I, I'm not aware of that. 
It has never happened to me. Every single one of, of what I'm sharing here are things that happen intentionally, have happened by design, have happened by being proactive, by going and pursuing collaboration with, with industry, by involving them in the discussions, by, by working with them, uh, sometimes pair programming with them, sometimes just having like just weekly meetings with them. None of, them, none of this is, is the result of chance or randomness. And the reason why I'm sharing you this with you is that if this is what you care about, then you have to be intentional and pursuable. Maybe you don't care about, maybe you care about, you know, publishing papers, maybe you care about, you know, getting a large number of citations. Whatever it is that you care, I challenge you, find what you really care, what you really are passionate about and excited about and have to be intentionally pursuing it. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. So another lesson is to proactively um, look for the things that you care about, but also to be flexible. So uh, in, in 2012, I went to IBM because we were organizing the refactoring workshop in Zurich. So I went to IBM, so Eclipse Java Development Tools, it's, it's uh, uh, in, in Zurich, in, in, in IBM's location in Zurich. So I went to them and I said, well, I'm really excited about, you know, Lambda expression. Lambdas were coming in Java, and this was 2000, uh, 2012. And, and can we do some refactorings that are targeting specifically Lambda expressions? And the Eclipse guy said, oh, this is very important, but, you know, unfortunately we are one year behind. You know, for us to build all our um, um, uh, infrastructure to use to be uh, Lambda aware, it will take us another, another full year to do that. So I didn't lose heart, so I went to the neighboring countries, uh, went to, uh, to Czech Republic, to NetBeans, to the guys who are working with Oracle there, and they say, well, we are not only that we are very excited about this, but we have already uh, migrated a lot of our infrastructure in the ID and the compiler infrastructure for Lambda, and they were so open and so eager to work with us. So we started with IBM, working for Lambda Expression, we ended up working with another company, learning a completely different programming model for NetBeans. I've never contributed to NetBeans before, so we had to learn a completely different refactoring engine, but still work on the same, on the same problem, and I had you know, uh, success uh, and practical impact because this ship was official release of uh, NetBeans and was one of the big highlights that Oracle highlighted at the Java One conference uh, next year. Uh, another story is, uh, the work that I've done with async programming, refactorings in the async programming, I went to Google and say, can, can we do something together? And I said, this is very interesting for us, um, but, but their heart and passion was not in this, was more in um, um, uh, security and privacy. Can we use refactoring to upgrade code to use the new permission, dynamic permission model that was coming up with, with Android uh, 6 or with, with the Marshmallow version of Android, and how can we use this to migrate code that was uh, using the old permission model to this new permission model. And again, this was uh, starting with the company to do something and we ended up working with the same company doing something completely different. And again, in this, in this example, they were involved. They simply <laughs> even changed the direction of our research and we were adaptable and we were flexible and we said, this is cool, let's, let's work on it. So, so having a plan but also being flexible, it's one of the, one of the key crucial insights that I've been learning over the years. Uh, this one is probably the most important one that I just want to finish with. Uh, and a major theme in the talk today has been about growth. How do we grow a community? How do we grow our students? Um, but the truth is that we need to grow ourselves before we grow others. So I don't know how many people flew here yesterday, but when I flew on my flight, the flight attendants, just before we were taking off, you know, she said, you know, make sure in the event of an you know, unlikely event of an emergency evacuation, uh, uh, you know, uh, or, or in an un unlikely event that, that you know, the, 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 the pressure is going to decrease in the cabin, you know, um, oxygen max is going to come, and then he said, you know, she said, put your mask first before you help other, uh, before you assist other passengers. And this reminds me of how important it is that we need to grow ourselves first. If we, if we don't grow, we don't have anything else to give to others. So I used to believe that uh, I will automatically just grow through life, through simply living more life, through experiences, you know, I'll be shaped by this. Um, but I'm discovering that experience is not the best teacher. I'm discovering that some of us just go through life, other people grow through life. Right? So, so I discovered that not experience, but it's the evaluated experience that's the best teacher. It's having this intentional mindset that we are looking forward to learn, to grow from experience. Um, that's what, that's what helps us to be intentionally growing. It's not by accident, but it's by design. 
So I'm surrounding myself with a group of other, uh, with a small group of other professors who are like-minded, who are intentional and dedicated to grow ourselves. Uh, we, are, we are dedicated to become, uh, to study from each other, to learn from each other, to learn together, to, to how to become better persons, how to become better mentors for our students, how to become better parents and, and better spouses. And uh, I realized that we can grow together because it's contagious. When you see other people growing, it also uh, it sort of like has the contagious effect. It helps us to grow as well. And I would love this opportunity. If some of you want to join us, want to grow together with us, um, just email me or you know, talk with me at the end, and uh, I will tell you how you can join this group and how you can see a tremendous growth in your own life. So um, I just want to thank uh, my students, uh, without them, I wouldn't have had anything else to share today. So lots of PhD students on the, on the left-hand side and lots of undergrad students here on the right-hand side who have been working in my group. And truly, I have been learning from them as much as they've been learning from me. So we've been all growing together. And uh, as a conclusion, I summarize what we talked about here, about all this growth that we have seen in our community uh, was all enabled by the fact that we were open to new ideas, we refactor the refactoring community. Uh, we were also open to grow this community, to, em to embrace other people, embrace new ideas, uh, to sustain and, and, and to bring other people in the community. And um, uh, I share a little bit about some of the works that we have done in the area of refactoring for mobile and how to improve responsiveness uh, via async programming in mobile. And then I just finish with this, some of the uh, four important lessons that I've been learning. And I was so excited to share this with you. So uh, uh, I know that, that, that you know, probably your energy level uh, has been decreasing as mine has <laughs> decreasing over, <laughs> over the uh, duration of the presentation, but this is where I uh, truly like to, to uh, thank you guys. Uh, you've been extremely uh, patient and you've been uh, staying with me through this whole long journey and I would be happy to take any questions that you have now.